I was born on the 17th day of January, 1846. I go back as far as way along in the early 50s. My first recollection of public living, and especially political living, as I may call it, was when I learned as a boy of nine or ten that my home was in, in the state of Virginia. I didn't know about states before that time. Then time passed pretty rapidly because I was attending high school, and I remember distinctly the occasion when the John Brown, the poor man, sought freedom for the slaves. Is there in my state? I heard about it pretty distinctly. I felt sorry, and yet sympathizing with my elders, I felt some resentment. Now, while some in my section, Southeast Virginia, I knew of some brutality, as I call it, exercised toward some of the Negro slaves. As a whole, the Negroes got along very well. Now, my father's Negroes, why I associated with them, that being the baby of the family, I didn't have any white children for associates. Therefore, I played around with the Negro children. Four years passed by. Then came up the great struggle when the Republican Party had become a, a power in the land. In 1860, Mr. Lincoln was elected, as you know. And I remember that uh, there was a good deal of excitement in my section, that the Negro slavery would be interfered with. Negroes would be set free and all that. Well, I didn't feel much interest about it because I, I felt kindly toward the doctors, and they were kindly toward me and toward my family. <clears throat> Now, I was attending school, as I said, and when in the spring, spring of 61, when uh, news came that war was actually declared, in fact, it had been coming when South Carolina, as we heard, seceded from the Union. Well, wonder now what Mr. Lincoln will do when he is uh, seated on the presidential chair. Well, there was a variety of feeling about it, even among our 75 or 100 young men, boys, at school. But right at once, when war was declared, about half of our pupils, young men over 18, quit school, joined companies of uh, infantry, cavalry, and in their homes, in surrounding counties, and in that vicinity. I want to go too, but my father said, Now, son, you're too young. I was just 15, just a little past. And if the war continues long enough, you may have an opportunity. Well, so I rested, and the war began, and I heard about it. And I heard that at the Battle of Williamsburg, some of my classmates fell in the battle there. Well, I grieved about that because they were boys that I'd been brought up with. They were a little older than I, but I felt sorry that they were killed. <clears throat> then, in 62, although General Lee had still a pretty good army, he began to need more men, naturally. Although the big battles, or the largest battles, had not come yet, but my neighbors around there, some of them who were over 45, kinsmen of mine, some of them, began to uh, just get up, to get up a, a company of cavalry. And I, a boy of 16 and a half years old, joined the cavalry company, which afterwards was attached and counted with others among the 24th Virginia Cavalry. Now, for a long time then, from August 62 on, until 64, great battles had been fought in there. We heard of the Battle of Gettysburg. And finally, our corps, our camp company, was taken away from the Blackwater border, guarding this, that section of the country from the incursions of federal soldiers who might cross the Blackwater River 
and the Chuan and come over into Confederate territory. We were taken in the spring of 64, our regiment was, uh, in the neighborhood of Petersburg. And while we were camped just north of Petersburg, General Grant began his invasion of that part of Virginia. We heard about it, and I remember very distinctly one morning we heard that General Lee had crossed James up north and was coming down the Turnpike Road to, in the direction of Petersburg, just near us. <clears throat> and the next morning, happening to look while I was on guard, across the James River, there we saw long lines of blue. Now, the infantry of the, of the Army and the United States flags on the other side of the James coming down to the beyond the mouth of the Appomattox River that flows into the James uh, in order to cross on the pontoon bridges and thus begin the invasion of that part of Virginia and in the city of Petersburg. Thus, I was not with that part of the army. My regiment was moved up north of Virginia, out of Richmond, I mean, north of Richmond, and thus we guided that city for several months while General Lee and General Grant were struggling there near Petersburg. While that was going on, there were some skirmishes and one, well, small battle I was in. I was not in any of the large, larger battles, probably fortunately, maybe unfortunately. Well, General, uh, General Ewell commanded the, the General Lee's Corps uh, near Richmond, and I remember we were called up one day and took the Darbytown Road and some mile or two, I don't know, we never counted distances or time in those days. <clears throat> and we turned off from the road, made a road, and went down a road through a wood. After a while, came to an opening, and there was a line of blue boys and with some artillery. And we charged them, and that's where I was struck the first and only time in my leg, which laid me up uh, two months. I was sent home on furlough. Now, I want to bring in one or two little points there that might be sort of interest to some. We were around Richmond, my regiment was, all the time then, on doing little or nothing, while the war was still going on. And after a while, a Saturday evening, the first day of April, 1865, we were ordered, and by the way, in the meantime, about half of my regiment had lost their horses. The Confederate soldiers owned their own horses, and when they lost a horse, it was difficult at that stage to secure a substitute. Anyhow, I lost mine. I've forgotten just now how. I don't, don't, believe, I don't believe it was in battle, however, at that time. <clears throat> now, orders came for a dismounted part, or demounted, I might say, of the regiment to fall in line and march. We stopped on the way and spent the night. That is Saturday night. The next day was a beautiful day, Sunday. We didn't know what was going on. We were, we were within a mile of Richmond, and there was a turmoil there. And that day, as you all know, that day, the uh, President Davis was attending his usual services at his church, St. St. Paul's Church, right in the midst of the sermon. The door, front door opened, and a courier rushed in and read it, went up to President Davis, handed him the paper. He opened it, and it was a dispatch from General Lee saying, Mr. President, I am so heavily pressed by the enemy that I'm compelled to abandon Petersburg. Mr. Davis arose and left, and the, the public, the uh, congregation broke up, and in a few minutes almost, there was pandemonium then in Richmond. We marched out of Richmond early the next morning, on the 3rd, 
and started in a southeasterly direction. I really didn't know which way, uh, which way you know, where we were going, but afterwards it showed that we were attempting, under General Ewell's command, to uh, come in contact with General Lee somewhere down uh, southwest of Petersburg. Well, the Federals under General Sheridan overtook us, our command of about 3,000, at in Amelia, at in Amelia County, Virginia, and after fighting several hours, why General Ewell surrendered us, and thus I became a captive. I went to prison along with this command, and we landed in Point Lookout, Maryland, down here. And the day after we reached there, as a curious boy, I rose pretty early. We'd just gotten there the afternoon before. I rose pretty early and went out to see how things looked around in there. There were, were 20,000 of us, a large encampment. Having to look across in one direction, I don't know which, well, there was a flagpole and a flag on it just rising. I stopped and looked at it with curiosity. It stopped when it got halfway. Well, I knew what halfway uh, flag on a pole meant. I looked at it. I thought, well, the rope that handles that flag must have a knot in it, and I'll see a man presently going up that pole to untangle it. I waited a whole minute, and I casually turned my face in another direction, and there was another flagpole with flag half mast already. So I put my head in the tent. Uh, there were five, six others of us. I said, boys, there must be some big Yankee dead. I wonder who it can be. Of course, we had no means of knowing. And then we waited for about an hour. The sergeant blew a bugle. We, 150 of my company, fell in. And as soon as he finished calling our name, a number of us rushed up and said, Sergeant, what does the half flag mean? His face fell. He says, President Lincoln was shot last night. Well, the, uh, the feeling, the variety of feeling that came over us 20,000 men in just that one. Of course, there were several other prisons, as you know. But as for me, and a boy, just 19, I didn't know what to think. I couldn't feel any hatred toward Mr. Lincoln, especially. I didn't feel any special hatred toward any federal soldier. And when I began to think how kindly General Grant afterwards on the 9th acted toward General Lee, I, uh, I felt kindly toward him. <clears throat> now, comes up the question of what we Southern soldiers fought for. My friends, as a boy of 16 and a half years old, I didn't think about any of abolition of slavery. My mind wasn't developed enough to take in what the politicians had in mind. And hence, there was no trouble as to the freedom of the slaves. About half of the Negroes, my father the Negroes, left and went to Norfolk to be under, as they considered, protection. But another half, 40, 50 of them, remained there and cultivated the crops until after the war. The South did not fight for the preservation or extension of slavery. General Lee, as is well known, was making arrangements to free his Negroes, and his father-in-law had already drawn up a part of his will, free his Negroes. My friend, it was a great curse on this country that we had slavery, and I thank God that I did not bring up my boys and girls under a system of slavery under which I was brought under. What did you boys fight for then? Here's what great many people do not know. That as a young man that way, I couldn't understand it fully. But I look back now and see my part in it and saw what we struggled for. And that was for states' rights. For states' rights. And as great many of you know, immediately after the war, the rights of the various states, well, especially in the South, were very much curtailed, if I may use that word. And since then, I have noticed, you let things come up, 
that encroach on the ordinary states' rights which we have preserved, and we find that the North, the boys that wore the blue, are with us in preservation of the states' rights. The South did not fight for the preservation or extension of slavery. General Lee, as is well known, was making arrangements to free his Negroes, and his father-in-law had already drawn up a part of his will, free his Negroes. And so what we struggled for, and that was for states' rights, for states' rights. And as many of you know, immediately after the war, the rights of the various states, well, especially in the South, were very much curtailed, if I may use that word, 